And please turn in your Bibles now to Daniel chapter 1. This is such a wonderful book to study, and I trust you're being encouraged by these early words in Daniel the past couple of weeks. And um, I'm excited about what we have in front of us. I think that in as much as the first chapter is a setup for the rest, I think that it gets more and more exciting as we go. So we're looking today at chapter 1, verses 8 through 21, and we'll start right at the end of where we left off last time, where we learn of the names of Daniel's friends. And so we'll read from verse 6 there. Now among them, the, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths of your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please let your servants be tested for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence, and the appearance of the youths who are eating the, the king's choice food. Deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine which they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for a matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. <laughs> While so many were exiled from Babylon to Jerusalem, from, from, to Babylon from Jerusalem and Judah, we have the privilege of a zoomed in perspective of these four men of Israel Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Theirs are some of the most incredible stories we have in Scripture. And while for this first section we find that it's not the most difficult of tests for them, it is smaller tests like this which lead to faithfulness in greater tests. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah will eventually be cast into a fiery furnace because they will stand against idolatry and false worship. Daniel will be cast into a lion's den. But for each of these men, they, they began to take smaller stands before those greater, more high-pressure tests. This is the way it is for all of us. If, with God's help, we are faithful in the smaller things, we are setting ourselves up to be faithful in the greater tests. Jesus said in Luke 16.10, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. He is simply stating what we see to be the case throughout Scripture and really the case throughout all church history and even the case through our own experience. Those we see to be faithful in even the tiniest detail are those that we tend to find are, you know, if they're faithful in that small detail, how faithful are, are they when they're doing something, faced with something greater? But even as we observe brothers and sisters around us, we, we observe this is true. 
testing reveals character. You may not think you have as significant a test as these men. You may not be standing before kings and rulers who demand things of you, but there's no doubt that you are tested and tried as silver and gold in the furnace. If you're the Lord's, you're tested. In fact, even if you're not the Lord's, you're tested, but you're proven to be false. You're proven to be fool's gold or something else. There's no doubt that you're going to undergo these kinds of things. Somehow, some way, the Lord tests you. And it isn't like every time it happens, you consci- consciously think, okay, the Lord is testing me in this moment. I must do this. Wonderful. I've just, I think, passed the test. That's, that's not normally how these things go. Oftentimes, you're not really thinking about it. And maybe in hindsight, you can look back. Or maybe somebody else can, can point out, hey, you were faithful in that situation. You did what was right in that situation. Maybe others didn't notice it, but I noticed it. And that's a wonderful thing. But often, these tests just come and go. How do we train ourselves to be sure that we're passing the tests as we go? We often recognize that even if others were to assess us as faithful, we haven't really done something significant. It could even be that Daniel and these men of God were not spending much time thinking of this particular passage here as a trial based on how godly they were through the book it seems they instinctively responded to the king's desires in a godly way and chose to make their position known and ideally that's how we want to be the difference between someone who is okay at a task and one we would call proficient or excellent in their efforts is the difference between one who is striving with some measure of difficulty and one who finds it to be second nature But to become proficient in anything requires repetition. We need to constantly be exercising faithfulness in order to be found faithful. Some of you may think, why, Lord, do you give me these successive trials? This is why. As Daniel shows us, it is the successive trials that prove God's faithfulness and yours ultimately. And obviously we know that there is a sovereign um, essential component there to recognize if we are found faithful in the end, who do we praise for that? Not, not I, not, not you, not us. We praise God. But if we are found unfaithful, who do we blame for that? Me, you, us, right? And so what we, we recognize is there's effort for us to exert, but if we can even do it, we're praising the Lord that he's allowed us to have the strength to do it. We want to be someone who continues to pass the test as we go through our lives, to be found faithful. The the goal of our sanctification as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ should be to live in such a way that increasingly we know what to do and actually do it instinctively. You might not think the small things matter, but they matter to God. It's important to the Lord how we respond. Now, the difficulty also with sanctification is that while you really will do what is right more instinctively over time with God's help, you will also go through more difficult tests which challenge you to continue growing in your sanctification. By definition, if you're stronger for something, that last test is not going to try you anymore, is it? You've now accomplished, you've, you've achieved your ability to go through that test. God will give you increasing tests to strengthen you over time. It's just like athletes. Athletes are trained Are athletes ever satisfied that they've sort of reached the pinnacle of their career? No, they lament when they're at the their their um, pinnacle of their career because it means that everything else is downhill from here. And I think that uh, even while we have vigor in our youth and over time we we grow weaker when we get near the the later stages of our lives, it's not that way with our sanctification. With our sanctification, it should be that we are continuing to grow stronger even while our body becomes more frail. And which is a more important strength, brothers and sisters? The strength of your flesh or the strength of your character? I think we know, reading Daniel, what the answer is and reading the rest of Scripture. So the difficulty is it's going to get harder. You will go through more difficult tests which challenge you to continue growing in your walk with the Lord. There is no autopilot for sanctification. Sanctification is more like driving a manual car. Anybody drive a manual car still? Or anyone have driven a manual car? You know what I'm talking about, right? Who thinks it's better, by the way? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, of course, of course, it's much better. I, actually, I love the bumper stickers they have on some of those now where it says anti-theft device on board and it's a picture of a gear shifter. <laughs> but what is, what is great about the manual vehicle and also more difficult about it is that you have more control personally about what the car does. So the car is not choosing for you which gear to be in, you're choosing. So it's a little bit more complicated, but it means that, that also you have to be more alert you can't roll back on a hill because your clutch is in. You have to understand how the dynamics of the clutch and the brake and the, the, the accelerator works so that you can have a balance and you can get through difficult situations. And so the Christian life is very similar. There's, there's no autopilot. There's no auto shifting in the Christian life. You are having to make decisions consciously all through your Christian life. You might even, some of you feel, I feel this way, like it was pretty easy in some respects not being a Christian. Before I was a Christian, I did sort of feel like I was on autopilot. I just did whatever I wanted to do. Now there's a battle. And so you're fighting your way through life, but you've got the Lord on your side. So in one way, it's you, you have victory over sin. And so it's easier. But in another way, you've got to stay alert and you got to have the pedal to the metal and keep going. But I love this story in chapter one because Daniel and his friends are really in some ways like the traditional modern evangelical Christian. They are not particularly cool. They're old fashioned. They're sometimes called prudes or legalists. They're the Bible thumpers. They don't get drunk. They don't party. They don't care about impressing celebrities. They wanna honor the Lord with their lives. I remember in my 20s meeting um, believers who were now I understand very immature in their faith, but it seemed like if anything was pressing the boundary, pushing the boundaries in the Christian life, they wanted to do it. And they did that in the name of not being legalistic. And so they swore, they, they got drunk, they sometimes slandered people, they did all kinds of things. And it was just all like, well, let's not be legalistic here. God, God's, his grace saves us. And what I learned over time was that's, that's a false form of Christianity. If you think that you can come to the Lord, he can wash you clean of your sins so that you can continue in sin, you're sorely mistaken. He has washed you clean from sin to keep you out of sin. And when you sin, he says, to come to him and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, that cleansing is to continue. You are once and finally free from the penalty of sin, but the evidence that you're really Christ is that you have now a power over sin. And I think what we're watching in Daniel, even at the very outset here, is we're watching men who have power over sin. And they have that not by their own strength, they have that because they belong to the Lord. So we want to make sure there's obviously the two ditches in, in the Christian walk is legalism on, on one end where you really do believe you gain pleasure, gain the, uh, the um, affection and love of God by your works, uh, which is totally false. It's by grace that we've been saved. But the other ditch is this antinomianism or this anti-law kind of idea where we just think, well, we don't have to do anything Christ has done at all. He's done it all in terms of what is imputed to you. His righteousness is imputed to you. It's given to you. It belongs to you. You stand in that so that you will not endure judgment at the end. But he calls you now to live holy. Be holy for what? I am holy. So your reason for being holy is because. So actually, the, the fact that Christ is holy, yes, of course, um, he is holy, but it's be holy because he is. So that should be the reason that we desire to be like this. But we realize that there are many, um, especially among evangelicals today, who can be offensive or crass or whatever, and they just think that that's, that's fine. Well, what they're really showing you is that, and they might, they might be right that some of these things are just small. You know, to say a swear is not the same as murder, but what they're showing is where they're unfaithful in what is least. And so we want to see that we grow over time. And the evidence is that those smaller things, those smaller details, like how, what comes out of your tongue, out of your mouth, the way you use your tongue 
even gossip and those kinds of things. Those are you or me being unfaithful in a little thing. So we want to understand all of that. But I did begin to see that genuine Christians typically don't care one bit about what the world thinks about them. Because this is the, the thing is they wanted to do those things, push boundaries, not ultimately because they felt they had freedom in Christ, but ultimately because they wanted favor with the world. They wanted to say, oh, we're not so much different than you. We just add Jesus to our lives. No, the genuine Christians I began to learn about, they didn't care if they fit in somewhere. They were not looking to be worldly. They weren't even looking for friends, especially friends who reject Christ. Everything they do is about knowing the Lord, obeying Him, and making Him known to others. And there's a purity in their speech and conduct which is unmistakable, and it's not phony. Like they've been raised to be good so that they're good. No, it's instinctive. They have the instincts of a Christian. Why? Because they're born again. Christ has changed them. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. Not every lesson in Daniel is about being courageous. We have to acknowledge that all through this book we do see genuine courage. But there is a lot in particular that we see about convictions, even convictions in small things. In fact, the point of this message in many ways, you look at his abstention from certain foods and probably most of you would read that and say, I don't totally get it. The meat is not forbidden elsewhere in Scripture. Um, not even wine in these, in these days were forbidden. So why is, why is Daniel making such a big deal about a little thing, seemingly to us? By way of recap, we remember from verses 6 and 7, these men had been taken from those of royal or noble descent in Jerusalem They've been given new identities. They don't just want to add names to their existing names, the Babylonians. They want to erase their identity as those fearfully and wonderfully made, male and female in the image of God, whose purpose is to worship the Lord and glorify Him always. How incredible that Satan's schemes are no different today than then. The identity thing has always been going on. Satan has always wanted to eliminate your identity which is through the lens of God and Scripture understood to be made in God's image. He's always been trying to erase that. It may be a new program today, gender ideology or evolutionary teaching, anything that gets our youth to forget God, but it is really the same objective for Satan to create young generations in his image and thereby pervert the way of righteousness, destroy faith and hope, and salvation in Christ. And so we look at this as a recap. Verse 6, Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. We've talked about how the commander of the officials assigned these new names to them. This was something Nebuchadnezzar did to assimilate them and all those he conquered into Babylonian society and into eventually his court service, in their case, where they would minister to him. He had to remove everything for and about them for his purposes. They were no longer to be Hebrew nobles and wise men, but were to be Babylonian. This is like an extreme form of the melting pot. You know how the American society always... Uh, sort of was known as a melting pot. Many cultures come in, but we all sort of become one new culture. That was the idea, a little bit less so to, the, to that extent in Canada, but that, that was kind of the idea. Nebuchadnezzar supercharged that idea, and it wasn't come into our country and learn to love our ways and embrace them. It was, no, we're going to force you to embrace our ways. You're going to take on new identities. This is how you're going to be. They were to be Babylonian. These were, of course, names that represented false gods, replacing their very biblical names. And they seem to have tolerated being called these names at least for a time, but there does appear fairly quickly to be something that they will not do. And we don't know why they continue to use these names, but they, they do. 
But you notice their true names do not go away. So at the end of our passage that we just read, we see that the king had seen these individuals and lists them by their own names that they were found to be 10 times better than others. It's sort of like the Apostle Paul. He has two names. They are used interchangeably at different times in his life. And so we don't have a theological significance of the difference of the name other than it's just a name from a different culture. Paul's uh, Paulos was a Greek form of his name and Shaul, Saul, was the Hebrew form of his name. So it is here, only in this case, of course, the reason they were given these names was to make them pagan, to paganize them. But in Genesis, we read that Pharaoh called Joseph Zephanat Panea, that's in Genesis 41. In Esther, the book named for this faithful woman who saved her people with the help of Mordecai, as I mentioned last time, she was also named Hadassah originally. And here, Daniel and his fellow men of Judah Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were given these new names. But as I said last time, we will find that they did not change their identities before God and before their people. And we'll learn through the book, they did not even change their identities before Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 8, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. Look at this. We have a guest on stage. That illustration was supposed to happen later. I apologize. We're trying this new modern thing. It's popular in churches, object lessons with living creatures. We want to be cool and trendy, right? Okay, who's a cat person here? Okay, who's a dog person here? Oh, I think the dog people went. Sorry, kitten there. Not as welcome as I thought. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. So let's stop there for a moment. That statement in itself, without any further details, tell you, tells you who Daniel was. You ever think of, a, think of your own potential to sin as this would defile me? You ever think on those kind of serious levels? I think those individuals I was talking about in my 20s, learning about those people who were calling themselves Christian but living in in unsavory ways, I think if they had that idea, they might have lived a little differently. And I, I pray that some of them have changed their ways in that sense. He did not want to defile himself. He may be in another nation, but he will not do as Babylon does. He may be willing to live and serve the king in that land according to the humility of his heart and the humility of his people after their capture, but he will not lower himself to the level of a pagan and defile himself. And it says, with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. The idea for defile here is to pollute oneself. Daniel did not want his body polluted. For a Jewish believer in the God of Israel, the desire to not pollute your body was out of a spiritual obligation, not to defile yourself as a worshiper of the Lord. There's no distinction in Scripture between some kind of defilement bodily that has no impact on your soul. Those things are, are connected because they're the same. In fact, I would even argue that Scripture presents the soul as more than just spirit. It is used in some ways interchangeably with spirit. But often when somebody is talking about the soul, they're talking about the whole person. And Daniel, certainly as a Hebrew, saw himself that way, as a whole person where even his body had impact. They are so connected, your body and soul, that to defile your physical form contrary to God's design in some way is to pollute your soul. We're not talking about stepping on mud here, walking out in the rain as we do today. Today, and some of you, thank you for 
parking in the far parking lot, stepping in that mud and that somehow defiles you inwardly. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doing something against scripture or conscience. It just happens that what it affects, first of all, is your body. Now, kosher laws, as we call them, would have covered this, the laws of Moses and whatnot. To eat that which God forbade mean, means that you would be sinning. In that case, if the particular foods that Nebuchadnezzar offered were against the law of Moses, Daniel would have had to have avoided such things. We don't, we're not told what foods they were. John Calvin actually believed Daniel took an even more interesting offense at the food and the drink of the king, which is certainly possible. He says this, that Daniel may have desired to refrain from too great an abundance of delicacy of diet simply to escape those snares of Satan by which he saw himself surrounded. He was doubtless conscious of his own infirmity. And this also is to be reckoned to his praise since through distrust of himself, he desired to escape from all allurements and temptations. As far as concerned the king's intention, this was really a snare of the devil. Daniel rejected it. And there's no doubt that God enlightened his mind by his spirit as soon as he prayed to him. Hence, he was unwilling to cast himself into the snares of the devil while he voluntarily abstained from the royal diet. You notice that the text talks about the king's choice food. So what he's saying is not this is the king's you know, swine or this is something that is so specifically anti-biblical for the Jewish individual. It's just the king's choice food. And Daniel felt that there was some reason that that would bring defilement on himself. Maybe it was extravagantly Babylonian. We don't, we don't know the details. But Daniel refused to defile himself whether by the law of God or by the general principles of avoiding all that which entangles. Second Timothy 2 says, Suffer hardship with me as a soldier of, G of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Paul basically gives you instructions that there are ways that you're going to live in your Christian life different from other Christians, things that entangle you that don't entangle other people. So you may even find a situation like Daniel here where something he knew would be an entanglement or an entrapment for himself may not have been for other people, but he felt that it was, and evidently his friends also took the same approach, Daniel being a leader in this. Anytime you sin outwardly, you have sinned inwardly to make that sin happen. As I say, there is not clearly a visible connection between what Daniel saw as defilement and what the king was serving. We're not told exactly what it was. We don't see that this so-called choice food was shellfish or swine or whatever. We don't see that it was meat sacrificed to idols, although some commentators think that might have been what the issue was. We don't have understanding of what was so offensive about the wine since Israel was permitted to have wines. But of course, there was a way that the vineyards were cared for. There's details around that. But we're simply told that Daniel was not willing to eat or drink what the king enjoyed in his extravagance. And that's enough for us to know that either it was straight up not kosher in the biblical sense, or that something else about it so troubled Daniel that he felt it would be sin to partake of it. Romans 14 tells us, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. So there's going to be situations where you are going to say, and I think this is the tragedy, is that you will often say something to friends of yours who are Christian, I can't do that, I think it would be wrong, and they'll say, well, my conscience is clear, and until you come to where I am, you're probably a weaker brother or something. This is actually in the context of a weaker brother. Daniel is not one of these weaker brothers. So there's something still a principle here. We must not do what is against conscience. And the tragedy in the Christian world today is that often your friends will come along and say, oh, you shouldn't have a conscience issue about that. But it may legitimately stem from something where you say, no, that to me would be an entanglement. To me, that would be sin. And you have to, in those circumstances, say, we can disagree on this. 
I'm not doing what, what I don't believe would be by faith, because if it's not by faith, it's sin. In context, as I say, Paul's speaking about how to b- behave when there's a weaker brother, because you don't want to make him eat something, even if you know it's right for you. This is basically looking at it from the other side, where you actually have the stronger brother believing that there's something that we should not be doing in the case of Daniel. Certainly it applies that whatever is not from faith is sin. And so even in circumstances where you don't know what you should do in a situation, but you realize that quite possibly one of your options is very bad and potentially morally bad, you can rightfully hesitate. So sometimes you'll approach a situation, you say, I'm not sure if I can do that as a Christian or if I should or if it would be wise. And sometimes that's enough to just say, therefore, I'm, I'm not going to. And I'm not going to find out later whether it's, not, whether it's right or wrong after I've already committed to do something that, that possibly troubles me. We have to be a lot more careful, I think, in these circumstances. Too often, we urge one another, oh, don't worry about it. And it's not much different than when you're little and somebody says, oh, don't worry, nobody's going to find out. But the, the sort of more mature, and I say that in, in quotes, form of that is, don't worry, nobody will care. Or don't worry, God won't care. But again, if it would be sin for you, don't do it. Verse 9, now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. That's the summary statement followed by the fuller description This again is like the beginning of the chapter when it says that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem and God gave Jehoiakim into his hand. God in his sovereignty did that. So too God in his sovereignty granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. At the same time he was giving Judah into the hands of Babylon, he was giving Daniel favor. He listened, and while it would take some convincing, this man who was appointed over them went along with this concern, not without some arm twisting, however. Verse 10, and the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. This man was nervous to do anything outside the intentions of the king. He believed he could even be killed for disregarding the king's orders. But you see, Daniel had determined to seek God's perspective first, and he was not worried about what the leader over him that the commander had appointed would think. He very much exhibited the kind of thinking that Jesus urges us to have in Matthew 6. He says, Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's all that Daniel is doing, is seeking the heavenly perspective before anything else. And of course, Jesus goes on to say, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If you really believe those things, then even when you need to confront somebody or go before somebody who could cause trouble for you and say to them, I won't do this thing that I've been asked to do, you're seeking that heavenly perspective first. You just watch how God works through those circumstances. It's amazing the numbers of times that people do, Christians, faithful Christians, do something they think that they should do that's really hard to do, and they come away and they go, I don't know why I was so worried. How often has that happened to you? It's happened to me many times where I just think, why did I agonize or maybe even have a sleepless night going into this, knowing all I was doing was what I felt God wanted me to do, and I worried so much about the outcome. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about food or drink or clothing or all the rest of those things. Worry about what's right before God and just let him take care of the details. Daniel was not concerned to eat the king's food and partake of his wine. He was concerned not he, he was not concerned that he would starve if he didn't have those things. But he was a good negotiator. Verse eleven, but Daniel said to the overseer whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
Please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. 10 days is certainly a very short period of time, not long enough really for a diet, maybe a crash diet, not long enough really to get in shape, at least under normal circumstances. Everybody does that once in a while though, right? You go and you're like, I'm going to get in shape. And you spend a week and you're like, that was great. Amen. Amen. I'll do that again sometime. <laughs> but Daniel had great trust that the, the outcome for him would be in God's hand if God was for them. So verse 13, he says, Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. This is the idea that we may resist what the government says, but we are prepared to endure some consequences also. Daniel was ready to go and actually suffer under the consequences of what was going to happen. We don't want to eat the food, but we also know that we could be punished if this goes badly. That's what Daniel is certainly understanding. And so he says, deal with us if you must, if our plan does not yield some results. In verse 14, this is pretty incredible. This is how you know, indeed, that summary statement that God would give him favor is true because the one who said, I might lose my head if I follow you, verse 14 says, so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. Again, this is too short a time for an ordinary diet. It would be very unusual to end up fatter in 10 days under ordinary circumstances. This is something that God is doing to preserve them. This is not if you do something like Daniel did in 10 days, you're going to be a healthier person. Uh, there's so many times when there are miraculous things that happen in Scripture. And the point is, do faithfully like they were faithful, be faithful as they were, and the same miracle will happen to you. No, there was a miracle that was required there to demonstrate the validity of Daniel as a prophet. Remember through this whole thing, this is the context. Daniel is a prophet of God. God is going to do authenticating miracles to show he's a prophet. You and I are not prophets of God in that sense. We foretell certainly the truth of the word of God, but we're not prophets in that sense, needing authenticating miracles to validate our ministries. And so when we're faithful, it's not for that. It's not to see miracles happen. It's just to be faithful before the Lord and also to know that he ordains all things and works things out for our good and his glory. But he listened to them in this matter. He tested them. They looked healthier. And so it says in verse 16, so the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. Now, please don't do this with this passage. Please do not confuse Daniel's faithfulness not to defile his soul by partaking of the foods that the king had offered with a special diet intended for all believers of all time. A virtual dietary industry has actually formed out of this passage to direct you to what foods you should eat. There are several books by various authors on the Daniel Fast. For example, the Daniel Fast Cookbook, Meal Plans and Recipes to Bring You Closer to God. The Daniel Fast for Weight Loss, a biblical approach to losing weight and keeping it off. There's the Daniel Diet 20-Minute Recipes, a brilliant way to start living a healthy life by taking a biblical approach. And of course, the New York Times bestseller, The Daniel Plan, 40 Days to a Healthier Life. I don't know where they got 40 days from. This is 10 days, people. <laughs> According to the publisher of that one, The Daniel Plan is far more than a diet plan. It is an appetizing approach to achieving a healthy lifestyle by optimizing the five key essentials of food, faith, fitness, focus, get this one, and friends. <laughs> Daniel had friends. You see, that's, yeah. You see what they did there. <laughs> Daniel was able to do these things, and you can too. That's kind of the idea with these books. 
But you see how often in evangelicalism, we can latch onto a fad because we think it's somehow based on the Bible. But if we're honest, it has nothing to do with the Bible at all. Eating only vegetables like Daniel when Daniel sought to avoid eating the meat and wine of Nebuchadnezzar so that he would not be defiled is to take a Bible story completely out of context. You unnecessarily make recommendations to others based on a very bad interpretation of this text. There have even been some, forget just the, the short fasts and 40 days and whatnot. There are people who have argued out of this text that everybody who's Christian should be vegetarian. That is not what Daniel is proving here. Daniel is proving that by depriving him of things that make him healthy, he's still healthy because of the miracle of God. The point is, oh, he's eliminated something toxic in his life and you can too. No, the toxic thing that Daniel is eliminating in his life is unfaithfulness. I would rather be found faithful than found healthy physically. Sometimes those things can go together, but, but not always. We want to be very biblical the way that we do th- these things. It is not a diet mentioned here. He's just talking also about vegetables. We're not even told which vegetables. I don't know how they make detailed recipes based on saying just vegetables. I mean, there's a lot of options there. You and I have no insight into whether these were carrots and celery or some more exotic legumes that don't even exist in the modern world. Likewise with the wine. We don't know why Nebuchadnezzar's wine in particular would have offended him. But something about it would have had Daniel spiritually conflicted or worse, believing he was sinning to participate. And so he abstained and so did his friends Verse 17 says, as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And I don't think, I haven't read those books, I'll spare myself the time, but I I doubt that those books tell you that if you follow this diet, you'll also have wisdom and knowledge in this ability to interpret dreams. But if they were consistent in their interpretations, that's what they'd do. Because it wasn't just that these men became healthy, even though not eating meat and wine, drinking wine, but it was also that they became exceptionally knowledgeable and wise and intelligent. It's amazing how many people will search everywhere for knowledge and yet not seek God's help to achieve great wisdom. You might say, well, we're not all going to be super smart and intelligent. That's true. But to the extent that you can have wisdom and insight, do you not want wisdom and insight? Do you not want greater knowledge of God? Doesn't the book of Proverbs present the personification of wisdom to be sought after at great expense? Proverbs 2, 4 says, Seek her as silver, speaking of wisdom, and search for her as for hidden treasures. What we don't learn of is the desire of these men for wisdom, but the general pattern seems to be that those who seek wisdom, God will not withhold wisdom from. Look at 1 Kings for a moment. 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon is going to be made king. And we see that the Lord gives him effectively whatever he wishes He's going to be granted. We read in 1 Kings 3 from verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you. And you have reserved for for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern 
between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked for riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. It's like I'll sweeten the deal even further. Just walk faithfully after me. That is one who's, who sought the wisdom of the Lord. And Scripture is really replete with that. James also says, you have not because you ask not. You, you can ask the Lord for wisdom. Note that this was not when Solomon was two years old saying, Lord, grant to me wisdom and knowledge and understanding. This is Solomon well on into his days, now sitting on the throne of his father David, saying, grant to me wisdom here on forward. And God magnified and increased his wisdom. And now we have, in fact, the wisdom of God in the pages of Scripture. This isn't even something where you have to say, well, will I be like Solomon where he'll answer me and increase my knowledge so much? This is actually acceptable, uh, uh, presentable to you as a fount of knowledge in the Scriptures. And if you would just drink of it and, and so deeply that you understand it and study it and memorize it, you will be wiser than most people on the planet. You'll be wiser than your teachers, as Psalm 119 says. And for Daniel and his friends, like I say, we don't see a prayer of theirs to seek for wisdom, but it tends to be in God's economy that those who seek wisdom from above are those who receive it. So it's quite possible that they were those who already, well, they were those who already feared the Lord, and the God-fearer in the biblical sense is one who seeks his knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Now, if Daniel, one further thing is said in Daniel 1.17, where it says, in addition to these four youths be, being given knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom, Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Daniel had a special ability because he had a special calling. God gifts those who are called to a particular task with what they need for that task, with the tools and the abilities, and so he does so. Joe Sprinkle says, in terms of biblical theology, this statement invites the reader to associate Daniel with others who have had revelatory dreams and visions, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and the prophets. And you think about those men and you understand that that's exactly right for them also. They were given a special measure of gifting and blessing, particularly for what they were called to do. And visions in particular for all of them were part of their experience. Verse 18, then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. Now this is a massive day for the official, right? Who has given some leeway to Daniel because He's either going to lose his head or he's going to be found to have done what the king had asked. Verses 17 and 18 are key to understanding chapter 1. This was an early test for Daniel and his companions. Brian Chappelle says, the perspective that presents trials are preparation for tomorrow's battles underscores another reason that the Lord allows the pressure of defilement, that is the pressure for him to be defiled, protection. By being prepared, we are being protected from the consequences of our enemy's victories. Daniel will face greater battles than this test of his diet. He will have greater responsibilities than whether to eat vegetables or sweets. As a consequence of committing to serve the Lord with integrity, Daniel was without defilement. Verse 19 goes on and says, the king talked with them and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And a final statement that's made at verse 21, and Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus, the king. The king himself was a worldly man, knowledgeable in all of these things. When the scriptures give us this scene of Nebuchadnezzar finding them to be superior, it is not saying he thought they were smart, but what does he know? He's just a bumpkin. No, scripture is showing not only that he found them to be so, but that they were so. When it says, for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted him, it is revealing that they weren't, there weren't just a few branches of knowledge that he discussed. The king was inquisitive. The king was probing. The king was searching these individuals beyond these four. Many others also would have been uh, presented and, and shown to him. And he found them to be exceedingly great in contrast to the others. He found them to be knowledgeable in the ways that he required his courtiers to be knowledgeable effectively in all things, that of all the arts, all of the areas of mathematics and looking out into the stars, he found them to be surpassing all their Babylonian counterparts. And interestingly for them too, the Babylonian counterparts would have had all kinds of astrology and things that the, the Hebrews would not have been taught. And still he found them to be superior. Let me leave you, just since we don't have any more time here, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Ian de Good. He says, This theme of the faithfulness of God emerges again in the brief note with which the chapter closes, which literally says, Daniel lived until the first year of Cyrus. The first year of Cyrus was the year in which the decree was issued that enabled the Jews to return home. Some 70 years after the time when Daniel and his friends were taken into exile, we are thus reminded that God's faithfulness proved sufficient for Daniel throughout the entire time of the exile. Babylonian kings came and went. Indeed, the Babylonians themselves were replaced by the ruling world power by the Medo-Persians in the person of Cyrus, yet God sustained his faithful servant throughout that whole time. In the same way, he is able to preserve us throughout the trials and tribulations that we face, no matter how intense they may be or how long they may last, when the world does its worst, God's faithfulness is enough. I think that's a good closing argument for this passage here. What a blessing to know that God is faithful and he calls us to be faithful. He just calls us to follow him in his word, even follow him according to the best of our abilities and our conscience doing the things that we know to be right before him and avoiding those things that we know would be done without faith and thereby be sin for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your faithfulness shown through every passage of scripture and we particularly this morning thank you for your faithfulness to Daniel and his companions in the land of Babylon, exiled as they were, we remember that we are exiles in this land until our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.